we have an example now to assist us on how to approach the income tax computation for a resident person who has received foreign income from two or more sources. Kapinga is ordinarily resident in Zambia. In the tax year 2020, he earned emoluments of 125,000 kwacha from employment in Zambia. He did not pay any pension scheme contributions as he is over the normal retirement age provided for in Zambia. In addition, he also received the following income from foreign sources. Dividends from EST Incorporated, a company resident in a country called Estonia, 21,375 kwacha. Rent from letting property in a country called Estonia, 32,750 kwacha. Interest from savings with a bank in Estonia, 7,875 kwacha. All of the amounts of foreign income are nature of withholding tax charged by the tax authorities in Estonia. The ratio of withholding tax on dividends and rent is 40%, while that on interest is 25%. There is no double taxation convention between Zambia and Estonia. Double taxation relief is given in Zambia unilaterally. The Commissioner General has agreed to give any available double taxation relief by unilateral credit relief required. Calculate the income tax paid by Kapinga in the tax year 2020. We have been asked to calculate the income tax paid by Kapinga in the tax year 2020 which will be the tax paid in Zambia after granting double taxation relief because we have foreign income received in addition to emoluments from Zambian employment, which are domestic emoluments. How do we approach this question? Kapinga is ordinarily resident in Zambia and he has received income from both Zambian sources and foreign sources. The income from the foreign sources has a deemed Zambian source. We are aware that the emoluments from Zambian employment must have been charged to tax under the pay as UN system, and this tax must have been paid throughout the tax year. The question asks us to calculate the income tax paid. Therefore, no credit for the tax already paid under the payers UN system should be shown. We remember that the dividends and foreign income and foreign interest are deemed to have a Zambian source and they are chargeable to tax in Zambia the taxable amounts are the gross amounts, which are the amounts plus the foreign tax already paid. In the case of foreign rent, foreign rent is exempt from Zambian tax. Therefore, it will not be included as part of the taxable income. We now look at the computation. To start with, we must write the taxpayer's name, Kapinga. Then we title our computation. We are computing the amount of income tax paid by Kapinga for the tax year 2020. This can be computation of income tax paid for the tax year 2020 or personal income tax computation for the tax year 2020. And then we enter the taxable income, starting with emoluments from employment, 
125,000 kwacha, which is the figure we are given in the question. To this, we add the foreign income, which is deemed to have a Zambian source, dividends. The amount given as received, net of withholding tax paid in Estonia at 40%, 21,375 kwacha must be grossed up. To gross it up, we multiply by the fraction 100 divided by 100 minus the rate of foreign withholding tax. And 100 minus 40% will give us 60%. Therefore, 21,375 multiplied by 100 over 60 produce the gross amount chargeable to tax in Zambia of 35,625 kwacha. Next, we have foreign interest. The amount received of 7,875 is net of foreign withholding tax at 25%. This will be grossed up by multiplying by the fraction 100% divided by 100% minus 25%. And 100 minus 25 is 75%. Therefore, 7875 multiplied by 100 divided by 75 produce 10,500 kwacha. The two amounts of foreign income are added up to produce 46,125, and this is added to the emoluments to produce total income chargeable to income tax of 171,125 kwacha. After this, we then prepare the computation of income tax. Income tax is being charged on 171,125 kwacha. The tax table shows the income bands to which the rates of tax 0%, 25%, and 30% apply, which add up to 74,400 kwacha with any income above 74,400 kwacha being charged to tax at 37.5%. And tax on the first 74,400 kwacha of the income amounts to 9,960 kwacha. Tax on the balance at 37.5% will be tax on the income above 74,400 kwacha, which is 171,125 kwacha minus 74,400 times 37.5%, producing 36,272 kwacha, and total income tax charged of 46,232 kwacha. This income tax includes tax which has already been paid in Estonia on the dividends and on the interest. We must now grant double taxation relief. We are told double taxation relief will be granted by unilateral credit relief as this is what the Commissioner General has agreed to. We must prepare workings for this purpose, starting with the dividends and ending with interest. And these workings are as follows. Number one, double taxation relief in respect of foreign dividends is the lower of the foreign tax paid. The foreign tax paid is 40% of the gross dividends which is 40% of 35,625 kwacha, producing 14,250 kwacha. Next, we also work out the Zambian tax on the foreign income, which is calculated using the formula gross foreign dividend divided by total assessable income multiplied by the Zambian tax charge. Gross dividend 35,625. Total assessable income being the income chargeable to income tax 171,125 kwacha multiplied by the Zambian tax charge 
46,232 kwacha produce 9,624 kwacha. The amount of Zambian tax attributed to the foreign income of 9,624 kwacha is the lower amount and this is what we enter as the amount available for credit under your unilateral credit relief as the method available for granting double taxation relief. Next, we do the same for interest. Working to double taxation relief in respect of foreign interest is the lower of foreign tax paid on interest, which is foreign withholding tax at 25% of 10,500 kwacha, producing 2,625 kwacha. Zambian tax on the foreign income calculated using the formula gross foreign interest divided by total accessible income multiplied by Zambian tax charge. 10,500 kwacha is the gross foreign interest, total accessible income 171,125 kwacha multiplied by the Zambian tax charge 46,232 kwacha producing 2,837 kwacha. The foreign tax paid 2,625 kwacha is the lower amount and this is the amount entered as the amount available for credit under double taxation relief in the computation. And given 9,625 and 2,625 as the amount available for credit adding up to 12,250 kwacha, the amount of income tax paid after this double taxation relief is 33,982 kwacha. We will see that double taxation relief was not computed on the total amount of foreign income but it was computed on the income on a source by source basis. Working one dealt with double taxation relief on dividends. Working two dealt with double taxation relief on interest. This is the way we are expected to deal with a case of granting double taxation relief under unilateral credit relief where a taxable person has received foreign income from two or more sources. Unit 6, Transfer Pricing and Thin Capitalization. What are the problems in this area? Problems in this area relate to failure to explain taxation implications of transfer pricing policies being applied. The other problem is inadequate explanations relating to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Transfer Pricing Guidelines. Lastly, there is failure to make adjustments where there is thin capitalization. Where there is thin capitalization, meaning a company has been funded with debt that exceeds it sums length borrowing capacity with the debt being provided by a related party such as the holding company or the foreign head office then part of the interest on that debt should be disallowed when computing the taxable profit of the enterprise in which the debt has been provided. Example, transfer pricing is the general term used to refer to the problem of allocating profits among a corporate group of companies. For a group as a whole, all that matters at the end of the day is the after-tax profit of the group rather than that of its individual members. Some countries apply their transfer pricing rules 
in purely domestic cases required a explain the application of transfer pricing rules in domestic cases b state six problems associated with the arm's length principle c state any two solutions for solving transfer pricing problems here we are given a short scenario in this scenario we are told for a group that all that matters is how much is the after-tax profit for the group as a whole whereas from a tax point of view it is important to establish how much is the taxable profit for each individual group company and therefore how much is the tax payable by each since these group companies may be resident in different countries for a domestic group there may not be so much of a problem regarding transfer pricing suggested solution a the application of transfer pricing rules in domestic cases may be required where there are different tax rates for different kinds of income or where some businesses are chargeable to tax at lower rates than others failing to apply transfer pricing rules in such cases would result in tax avoidance by domestic groups of companies where the same tax rate applies therefore transfer pricing rules may not be required in domestic cases because whichever transfer pricing policy is applied the amount of tax which will be paid to the revenue authority will not change but where different tax rates apply to different companies or to different sources of income or different businesses transfer pricing rules may result in taxes being paid to the domestic revenue authority being minimized here in zambia there is one tax rate generally for manufacturers therefore applying the transfer pricing policies of any type within a group of manufacturing companies in zambia cannot change the amount of company income tax which will be paid b the application of the arm's length principle in a transfer pricing transaction has the following problems lack of comparable prices lack of information risk of effective double taxation through disagreement over the transfer price huge information demands increased fragmentation within multinational businesses growing importance of intellectual property and other intangibles this part of the question only asked for this to be stated not to be explained or to be discussed so simply mentioning them is all that was required in part b part c solutions to the various problems of the arm's length so to the various problems identified in part b are advanced pricing arrangements and unitary taxation again here all that is needed is to mention what solutions may be applied to resolve the problems of the arm's length principle asked for in part b unit 7 international tax avoidance again here the main problem faced by candidates is issues regarding knowledge of tax havens other problems are faced in relation to 
providing explanations of the Zambian law approach to international tax avoidance. And lastly, issues to do with money laundering are generally handled well, probably because we have so much regarding money laundering being discussed even on the media, locally in Zambia, and on the internet as well as through social media. Unit 8, Indirect Taxes in International Taxation. This part of the syllabus does not prove to be a challenge to candidates. It could be because there are no computations required. All that is expected is narrative, usually by way of explanations. The minor challenges are faced in the areas of double taxation, the OECD model double taxation convention on the estates and inheritances, probably because here in Zambia, estate duty or inheritance tax are not applicable. Where there is an estate of a deceased person, it's still income tax that is charged. And whoever inherits that estate will only be required to pay the tax on that particular estate as assessed. No inheritance tax applies or no estate tax or estate duty is applicable. These are the specific weaknesses in respect of each of the eight units which make up the syllabus for paper D5 international taxation. We will now move to examination techniques. Which are the techniques to be applied to attempt to resolve these weaknesses and improve the pass rates for this paper. These examination techniques cover the steps which candidates should take before the examinations, during the examination, and after the examination. The period before the examination include the whole period when a candidate needs to study or receive tuition at an accredited tuition center. The period during the examination is the time when the examination questions are being attempted by the candidate. And the period after the examination is the period or the time after the candidate has attempted the required number of questions but the examination is closed by the invigilator. Preparation before the examination should ensure that a candidate decide whether to be on self-study or to enroll at a tuition center. It is important that if a candidate decides to be on self-study, that candidate must buy the learning materials and must create sufficient time for studies. Such a candidate must also read widely to be aware of trends in the world of international taxation. In a case where a candidate decides to enroll for tuition, that candidate must identify a tuition provider that is accredited to offer tuition for this paper. Zika has accredited a number of tuition providers and Zika may be approached to identify a tuition provider who is accredited and provides tuition near where the candidate resides. While there is time, the candidate should ensure they cover the following. Extensive use of past examination questions, suggested solutions, and examiner's reports. 
these are very useful to ensure candidates succeed. Suggested solutions provide guidance as to the depth of the answers which are required in the Zika examination. Practice the handwriting for three hours at regular intervals of time. Some candidates cannot maintain their handwriting for three hours. It would keep changing or they may just give up and fail to finish answering the questions in three hours. Practice answering questions within the examination time. The examination is for three hours and there are 100 marks which can be earned within these three hours. This therefore means the three hours when converted in two minutes is three multiplied by 60 which makes three multiplied by 60 minutes which make up one hour giving us 180 minutes. 180 minutes divided by the 100 marks which are available translates into 1.8 minutes per mark. So a candidate will need to spend 1.5 minutes per mark when practicing so that there is extra time at the end which can be used to go through the work that has been done and where possible make corrections or updates to the answers. As an examination candidate, it is important to learn the meanings of the requirement verbs which are used by the examiners so that they are interpreted correctly. There are six learning objectives. The lowest level is knowledge, which simply requires candidates to remember or recall what they have learned or what they have read. The requirement verbs which are used to test knowledge are one, list, which simply means make a list. List the methods of giving double taxation relief. Then the candidate will simply list one, treat relief, two, unilateral credit relief, three, unilateral expense relief. The next one is state, which simply means express fully or clearly the details or facts of. Next, we have defined where we are expected to give an exact meaning of what it is that we are to define. The next level, comprehension. What someone has understood. Here, the requirement verbs which are used are describe, which simply means communicate the key features of what it is that you are to describe. Distinguish, highlight the differences between the two variables where the distinction is required. Explain, make clear or intelligible. State the meaning or purpose of what it is you are asked to explain. Identify, recognize, establish, or select after consideration. Illustrate, use an example to describe or to explain something. Level 3. Application. Here, candidates are tested on their ability to apply the knowledge to given situations. The requirement verbs which are used are apply, which means put to practical use. Calculate which means ascertain or reckon mathematically. Demonstrate, 
prove with certainty or exhibit by practical means. Prepare. Make or get ready for use. Reconcile. Make or prove consistency or compatibility. Solve. Find an answer to what is being asked to be solved. Tabulate. Arrange in a table or prepare a table. Level 4. Analysis. Where we are expected to analyze something. Here the requirement verbs which are used are analyze. Examine in detail the structure of what we asked to analyze. Categorize. Place into a defined class or division. Compare or compare and contrast. Show the similarities and or the differences between the variables which are being compared or contrasted. Construct. Build up or compile. Discuss. Examine in detail by argument. Interpret. Translate into intelligible or familiar terms. Prioritize. Place in order of priority or sequence for action. Produce. Create or bring into existence. Those are the requirement verbs which are applied at level 4 analysis. Level 5. Evaluation. Here, candidates are expected to be able to use their learning to evaluate or make decisions or recommendations. The requirement verbs which are used are advise, which simply means counsel, inform, or notify. Evaluate, appraise, or assess the value of. Lastly, recommend. Produce a course of action. When providing advice, candidates are expected to produce possible actions which could be taken. And when making a recommendation, candidates must point out to one specific course of action which must be taken. Level 6, Synthesis, Create. Here, candidates are expected to use their learning to build patterns or structures so that new, new meaning is derived. And requirement verbs which are used at level 6 are Construct, which is to build up or compile. Compose. Use available information to develop a model or a theory. Create. Design something. Invent. Develop a possible solution to a matter. And justify. Defend the course of action or position that has been taken. Those are the requirement verbs which are used at level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5, and level 6. At D5 level international taxation, we are not likely to encounter level 6 of testing, although we will encounter level 2, 3, 4, and 5. The day of the examination. On the day of the examination, the candidate should ensure that he or she has carried stationery required for the examination. 
the examination, attendance, documentation, the invigilators cannot admit to the examination hall any candidate who fails to produce the examination attendance documentation and ensure that you travel to the examination center and arrive early so that within 30 minutes before the commencement of the examination the candidate gets admitted to the examination hall. The stationery which will be required to be used will include the pens which should be blue or black as well as pencils which may be used in case there is need to draw a diagram, a rubber where there may be need to erase if there is a mistake when drawing up a diagram. There will be also need to use a calculator and a ruler. The use of correction fluid should be avoided. If there is a mistake where a candidate has written something which is incorrect, it should be cancelled by crossing it out using the same ink that has been used to answer the examination throughout. Once the candidates have entered the examination room, they are given 15 minutes reading time and planning time. This time should be used specifically for reading the requirements and planning on how to attempt the questions. As we may have already heard, for this paper, there are four compulsory questions. So, there will be no question to be left out. All the four questions must be attempted. Therefore, as candidates plan, they should plan to choose which question to start with, which question will be the next, which question will be the third, and which question will be the last. Usually, the question which a candidate can answer very well, which is based on topics which they, un they have understood very well, should be the question to be attempted first. Then the next question being on the topic or topics which also they have, attempt, they, have, un, they have understood well. The question on topics which a candidate has not understood very well should be the last question to be attempted. So the 15 minutes should be used to read through the requirements so that we understand what areas of the syllabus are being examined and what we are expected to do in respect of each question. And once we have read these requirements, then we can quickly read through the scenarios. The 15 minutes reading and planning time is not time to start answering or writing down the answers on the question paper so that we transfer it into the examination answer booklet. It's purely for planning. When it's time to start answering, then we write straight away in the examination answer booklet provided. After reading and arranging the questions in the order they should be attempted, candidates must also ensure that they allocate time to each question. Each mark should be allocated 1.5 minutes. Each question in the paper D5 examination carries 25 marks. So instead of making it 45 minutes for each question, the time should be reduced so that at the end of the examination, there will be 30 minutes available to go through the answers to all the four questions. And during that time, those questions which were not complete may be completed by adding what may have been missed. 
and where some answers may appear to be incorrect, corrections can be made. When the writing starts, candidates must focus on answering each individual question without wondering or thinking about the next question to be attempted or the previous question attempted. This will ensure that the candidates strictly abide by the time they are allocated to answering each question. And once that time has elapsed, a candidate must leave the question and move on to the next question. The answer to each question must be started on a new page within the answer booklet. Even if on one page only the first three lines have been used to complete the answer to the previous question, the next question should not be answered just below those three lines. It should be answered on a new page, which is the next page. In a case where a question is subdivided in two parts, A, B, C, the answer to each part should be labeled in the same way, A, B, C. Where some parts are further subdivided, the same way, 1, 2, 3. For example, question 1, if question 1 is subdivided into A, B, 1, 2, then C. The answer must be subdivided starting with question 1, A, then B, 1, followed by B, 2, then C. If a candidate starts answering question 1, but they are not able to answer part A, but they can answer B1, B2, and C. They can straight away start answering B1, provided it is clearly labeled B1. After B1, B2, then C. Then leave space to answer part A. Probably, after answering B2, they may have an idea as to what is required in A and they can write down part A as well. Ideally, however, it is recommended the answer should be presented in that order A, B1, B2, then C. It's only in a case where a candidate is unable to answer A but can answer B and C that they may answer B1 and 2 followed by C before answering part A. In some cases, questions may ask for the answer to be presented in the form of a memorandum, a report, or a letter. When this is the case, candidates must follow the instruction, they must produce the answer in the form of a report, a memorandum, or a letter. If a letter is required, it must be an official letter, and it must be addressed to the person or office mentioned in the question. It may be, dear sir, dear madam, dear John, and so on and it should be concluded with a recommendation or advice as required and signed off as yours sincerely if the name of the recipient is mentioned, yours faithfully if the name is not mentioned. If we are writing a letter and there are figures which require to be computed. Those computations must be in an appendix to the letter. We do not need to write the letter first, then produce the appendices. Because the answer booklet requires to start on the first page, 
if it is question 1 we are starting with and it is the question that requires a letter to be written but there are computations required we can do the appendix on the first page showing the computations and once the computations are done we can do the letter starting on page 2 but make the references to the letters appendix for all the figures which are mentioned within the letter. Once a candidate has attempted the required number of questions, which are four questions for D5, it is important to check the work. As we said, there should be time left to check the work that has been done. Some questions may require answers to be updated. Those updates should be done within the time remaining after attempting the required number of questions, but before the invigilator declares the examination concluded. Once the invigilator declares the examination concluded, candidates must immediately stop writing and put down their pens and close the answer booklets. The invigilator must then collect the answer booklet. It is important that once the examination is de declared concluded, we all stop writing and we close our answer booklets as action may be taken in the event that we continue to write even after the examination has been declared concluded. In conclusion, to be successful in the paper D5 international taxation examination, candidates must understand the syllabus and all the learning outcomes as they prepare for the examination. Candidates must purchase the recommended learning materials and use them fully. Candidates must also read widely to understand the developments in the world of international taxation. Candidates must plan how they will attempt the examination questions during the reading and planning time provided which is the 15 minutes before the commencement of the examination. And this brings us to the end of the presentation.